Hey guys, how's it going? It's Austin Scott with Scott Trot, and thank you for joining me here on the return of the Paddock Party. It's been way too long here since our last episode, and I'm glad to have you guys back. Um, you may recall here, probably maybe close to a month ago already, I tried to do a little bit of a comeback show um, and just kind of updated you guys on what I've been doing in harness racing there in our couple months of absence, and tonight, finally have a chance to bring a guest back onto the show so i'm very very excited for that and it's a guest that a lot of you have been suggesting since i started the paddock party there at the end of 2020 um we'll get into him a little bit here in a bit but first i want to give everyone a chance to tune into this video and again Welcome to the Paddock Party. If you're new here, I'm Austin Scott. This is my Scott Trot Harness Racing fan page. And this is one of my live segments I was doing with some regularity at the end of 2020 and the beginning of this year. Uh, it's called the Paddock Party. And this is where I'll sit down and interview through Facebook a driver, trainer, owner, someone in our sport, uh, and to let you guys you know, learn a little bit more about them. So um, I'm still a very new harness racing fan, and one thing I notice is there's not a lot of video content out there about some of your favorite owners, drivers, trainers, and personalities um, and officials in the sport. So I figured uh, I'd start this interview segment, let you guys get a little more up close and personal with some of your favorite people in the sport of harness racing. So it's been a lot of fun so far. Trying to think of some of our guests that we've had so far. Chris Presley was on here. We've had Brady Galliers, Sean Barker, Tyler Smith, Todd Luther, Tyler Rush. Um, just a great group of guests here so far. I, I may be forgetting somebody, but again, we've we've had every guest has been um, incredible and and carved out 45 minutes to to maybe even as much as an hour of their time out, depending on uh, you know how many questions I had and how much they wanted to talk on on each topic. So it's been a lot of fun, and I'm glad you guys are joining me. So um, as I said in the description of this video. Uh, share this with your friends and family. Maybe they're already harness racing fans and they would enjoy this show. Or maybe it's somebody that's newer to the sport or doesn't know about the sport that wants to learn more. This may be a great opportunity for them to get involved. And at the end of the show, I do an open question segment for all of you fans that are watching. You can comment your questions uh, for our guest and I'll ask him at the end of our broadcast. So that would be pretty awesome. But... Um, Hopefully, again, you guys have been well here. I'm just kind of doing uh, a little talking and giving you guys a little bit of an intro to give everyone time to start tuning into the broadcast here with our guest again. Uh, I think it's going to be a really cool show here. So hopefully you guys have been well. Kathy Riley's watching. Kevin McFan. Tom Pinsonal. Hopefully I said that right. Billy Davis is watching as well. Thank you guys for tuning in. I really appreciate it. See if I can get anybody else in here. But yeah, like I said, share share this video out with your friends and family, maybe harness racing fans or uh, people wanting to learn more. So I'm just checking a few things here on our technical end to make sure uh, that we are up and running just fine. So it looks like everything's A-OK -okay so far. Looks like Greg Grismore tuned in the Grizz. How are you? Thanks for watching. Leslie Wobbler, thanks for tuning in. But yeah, we'll be bringing on our guest here uh, pretty shortly. Again, just going to check a couple of uh, technical things before we get up and going here. So uh, one thing I do with our guests before they come on to the show is I'll do kind of a test call with them to make sure both of our connections are working out well. It seemed that uh, we were all good to go, but there's also been times we would get maybe uh, three or four minutes into the show and things would start kind of going haywire. So... Again, we're going to try to make sure we have those ironed out for you. Cool. Let me see if I can get this up and rolling a little bit. Keith Cook tuning in also. How are you, Keith? Let's see. Trying to make sure we get everything up and rolling just fine. Let's see if we can go full screen. There we go. That's better. Well, cool. 
Well, uh, yeah, guys, let me tell you a really quick, uh, cool story here. So as some of you have heard me talk about in previous episodes of the Paddock Party, I've talked about, you know, my first couple of trips to the racetrack, uh, my first being in 2015 at the All Glaze County Fairgrounds in Wapak for their fair meet that they had it was the first time I was there. And the second year I was there was in 2016 for the All Glaze County Fair meet in Wapak again. And in that... Uh, in that event, there was a horse that kind of gravitated to me just strictly based on name. Again, I was new. I didn't know what was good or bad out on the track. Um, didn't know drivers very well and stuff like that just yet or strategy, anything about harness racing. Uh, but this horse alone got me on its name and it's Artist From Above. A very special horse now uh, for me looking back. Probably my first ever favorite horse, which is kind of cool to think about. But in 2016, um, I told my friends, uh, when we watched him race in 2015, he won. And uh, I joked with my friends that night that I was gonna go sneak down into the winner's circle and get my picture taken with them. And uh, I never did it. Well, in 2016, Artist From Above was there again. And I told my friends, I said, hey, if Artist From Above wins tonight, I'm definitely getting into that winner's circle picture. <laughs> and uh, sure enough, Artist From Above went out won the race so i had to hold up my end of the deal so let me see if i can get this here this is the win picture let's see if i can kill the glare a little bit this is the win picture from artists from above at the all Glaze county fair sorry it's back it's probably reflected backwards for you guys but you can see me i'm the big tall goofy guy here in the back holding up the number one finger so i did i did hold up my end of the deal and snuck into artists from above's picture in that one and uh, that was actually, I used that picture when I met Tim Ignarski, who's the owner and trainer of Artists From Above. Uh, the first time I ever met him, I took this wind picture out there and showed him, uh, and he got a pretty good kick out of it. Well, last weekend, they had the matinees at Salina, and um, DH Rockin' Artist, a horse that Tim owns and trains, and a horse that I've gotten to, to help since October, uh, got into the winner's circle at the Salina Matinee. So I actually got into my first winner's circle picture that I was allowed and welcome to be in. So kind of a full circle moment nearly five years later. So I'm there. Big goofy guy in the silver hoodie there. But uh, yeah, I finally got my first win picture that I was supposed to be in. So uh, pretty cool five years later and uh, still learning more and more all the time about the sport. So... Uh, just wanted to share that with you guys, and if you have any funny stories like that, feel free to share them here also. So, um, I've talked a lot here so far, but I think it is time to bring on our guest. Let me make sure uh, that he is tuned in watching right now. Let me get that taken care of. So I just sent a message in, but our guest tonight, if we can get all of our technical stuff lined up here, is Hank LeVan. So a name that you guys probably know well. Again, the LeVan name has been uh, in Ohio harness racing for, I believe, over five decades now. And again, when I started going to the races back in 2015 here at the fairs in Wapak, that was one of the first names that I heard back then. Uh, really loved their colors, that red that they have with the Curse of L on the back. Um, all their horses having the L at the end of their name and stuff was something unique and cool to me. Uh, so it's pretty cool. I'm going to bring Hank on. He had an incredible 2020 season last year. Uh, really, uh, again, the LeVan name is out there, but Hank was kind of making uh, a name for himself out on uh, the fair circuit. Also had some success at the raceways as far as some uh, <coughs> state fair stakes action, Ohio sire stakes action, and stuff like that. So we're going to try to bring Hank on here if I can get pulled up. Still having uh, a little bit of an issue here. Let me tune it back on. 
So what uh, what happens, I try to bring Hank on, and it'll alert me when he's watching on here, and for some reason our, our guest list is messing up here. Let me see once. Okay, here, oh shoot, we have it there for one second. We'll get it fixed up for you guys, I promise. But uh, yeah, we're gonna bring Hank on here. We got some questions for him. And again, uh, at the end of the broadcast, I will ask him your questions in the open questions segment. So feel free to comment those as you watch the video with us. I'm trying to get it to work. Let's see. Trying to get it going. Thanks for your patience here, guys. Okay, we got the request in. Let's see. go on here. There we go. We got it working now. Can you hear me, Hank? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I got you loud and clear, man. Thank you for uh, tuning in with me tonight and joining me on the broadcast. Again, you're a guy that uh, the fans of the show have been requesting to have on here since, I think, uh, November, December of last year. So to finally get you on is pretty cool. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, Hank. So uh, I was just giving a little bit of an intro, talking about your 2020 season you had. Obviously, uh, it was a really good one for you out on the fair, uh, the fair circuit, as well as at the raceways and stuff like that. So just how much fun was the 2020 season for you? I, it was great. You know, I kind of took a leap of faith and um, attempted to do it full time and it, it paid off. And uh, But no, we had a lot of fun last year and hopefully I uh, can continue to build on that. Absolutely. So who were some of the horses last year that, you know, your first full time season here in harness racing, who were some of the horses that were really pivotal in your success and helped you put yourself uh, kind of on the map, so to speak? Well, I would say without a doubt, uh, Bad Miss Johnson. Um, that mare was really good for us. Uh, I think she had 15 wins uh, last year and out of 30 starts. So uh, to be as consistent as she was, uh, it was huge. And, um, you know, even when the wheels fell off the bus with everything else, she still kind of showed up and uh, uh, did what she needed to do. Um, but no, she was very influential. And then um, we had a few two-year-olds that, uh, that had good years, like Calvin L, um, Amy and Jordan and, uh, um, that team L had a, had a decent year as well, but I would say uh, most definitely uh, Bad Miss Johnson. Absolutely. So a couple of your two-year-olds did have some success and uh, got some big checks, I think, during Sire Stakes and maybe even the State Fair Stakes, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Calvin was competitive uh, in that bunch there, like the Breeders at Delaware and uh, the Sire Stakes and uh, Bad Miss Johnson as well. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, I would say as far as for those horses that uh, – we're competitive at the next level. Those two uh, were probably the most competitive for us. Awesome. So um, talking about a couple of those two-year-olds that you're bringing back as three-year-olds this year, I wanted to ask you, you know, how, how has your winner gone? And we'll talk about some of the three-year-olds you're bringing back. How are they doing right now? Well, the, the winter was, was tough, but I think it was tough for everybody. Um, the month of February, the track just it just got bad. Um, we had so much snow and ice and rain, and uh, we didn't train a horse uh, the month of February. So we jogged and um, just tried to kind of get foundation miles on them, but uh, we weren't able to go any speed. Uh, but the three-year-olds, um, we started back uh, uh, with them, and uh, they're, they're all qualified and racing now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm happy with uh, uh, how they all started. Um, Calvin, you know, maybe didn't get the best, uh, uh, have the best luck early on. And, and Amy got really sharp, uh, uh, but she actually just got hurt here about a week ago. So she'll be done uh, oh. more than likely for the rest of the year, unfortunately. I had kind of big, big hopes and, and expectations for her, but uh, um, sometimes that's the way it goes. Um, but, uh, but, no, I think the three-year-olds are okay. Uh, I think uh, at least for the fairs and maybe uh, a little better than that, if they have a little luck, uh, they can be competitive. Absolutely. So where, where are you guys actually stabled at, Hank? 
Uh, so we're at Marysville, uh, they're the Union County Fair. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So we talked about the three-year-olds. For you, how many yearlings did you guys either, you know, get at the sale last year, or maybe do you have some homebreds and stuff like that that are two-year-olds this year? How are they doing? Yeah, so we, we've got two homebred uh, Payson fillies, uh, and then uh, I bought seven yearlings uh, with uh, family and then some, some partners, um, and then we've got another yearling, uh, or I guess two-year-old now uh, for, for a family from Florida. Um, so we started, I think, with 10. Um, we did have one of them that didn't pan out. Uh, but with what's left, uh, I think that they'll all be okay. Um, there's a few of them that I like better than others, but, um, you know, it's still early. Um, so far, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Absolutely. So what's the, what's the ratio on, you know, uh, Colts versus Phillies and then maybe Trotters versus Pacers um, in that bunch of nine or ten horses that are two-year-olds that you just mentioned? Uh, so we started out with the ten two-year-olds total. We had uh, two trotting Colts, two trotting Phillies, uh, three pacing Phillies, and three pacing Colts. So uh, we were fairly – balanced i guess across the board we've always had a few more pacers than we do trotters uh, the trotters are something i've kind of enjoyed here the last few years and i've tried to to cabbage on to a few more of those uh, at the sales if i can find one that uh, that i like that we can afford absolutely so are there uh, in that bunch of you know nine horses are there some really special ones you feel like in there or any that are leaning towards maybe being um, top stakes colts or fillies right now well i guess i hope so um, you know, they're, they're still uh, uh, all probably, you know, like everybody says, you know, uh, regard, you'll know how good they are the, you know, the first week in July, you know, is what everybody always says. But, um, but no, I, I've got a trot in Philly I, I think pretty highly of. Uh, there's two Payson Colts that I like well. Um, I, I think if those three can, can be competitive beyond the fair level, you know, whether it's Stallion Series or Sire Stakes or whatever that may be, I think there's three of them that have really got some, some extra ability, I guess you could say. Um, and then the others, you know, they do their job and, um, you know, they're getting better, uh, but uh, they haven't shown, you know, just probably as much ability as the other three so far. Okay. And then also uh, of those two-year-olds, you know, who are, who are some of the sires of those uh, Colts and, and Phillies? So out of the 10, they're all actually out of different sires, which is kind of, I guess okay. wild um, for the Pacers. There's a, a Pet Rock, a Western Terror, a Well Said, a Western Vintage. There's a Fear the Dragon, and then a um, Cardinal. And then for the okay. Trotters, there's a Break the Bank K, a What the Hill, a Big Chocolate, and then there was an Uncle Peter, but we don't have him anymore. So. Okay. Gotcha. And I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think of it. Uh, I can't think of it off the top of my head right now, but you guys have had some success with uh, Break the Bank K Trotters, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. The Air Jordan, um, she was a, she's a three-year-old trotting filly now, but she had a good year last year, especially at the fairs. Uh, she was always really consistent, and that's what she was. Um, I know a lot of people don't care for the Break the Bank case, especially the Phillies, because they're kind of hot and, and can be a little rude. Um, but so far, I've, I've, I've enjoyed actually messing with them. Um, we've had a little luck with them, and, and I really like the, the trot and Philly that I've got this year. It's a two-year-old, and that's what she's by. Okay, so. awesome, awesome. So that's pretty cool. So, um, so once you get these yearlings home, or again, if they're homebreds, you bring them to, to your stable and stuff like that, what is the process of, of breaking them like? For you, for example, on the first day you bring them home from the sale, what do you typically do, if anything? So normally what we'll do is we'll take them there to the farm, actually, uh, at my parents, uh, and we'll get them home, get them in the stall, and then uh, just really kind of forget about them, you know, put feed in and um, you know, make sure that, you know, I guess you kind of glance at them and try to not have too much buyer's remorse. Uh, but normally the day, the day afterwards, we'll turn them out and watch them out in the field a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And then I guess when we start breaking them, um, we've done a little bit of both. We've had, uh, we've broke some of them ourselves, but then uh, the JVS there at uh, Delaware, um, they have a high school program uh, where they break colts and stuff like that in the fall. So okay. what's helpful for us is if I can send a few of them over there and let them get the rough edges off of, the, off of them while we're still racing some of the two-year-olds. Um, like I think this past year, we had 
10, and I think all of them went over except for one for at least a short period of time. Um, okay. And uh, then when, when COVID hit, uh, they had to uh, – um, to send them all back. So I had one colt that never went over there that we just ended up breaking ourselves. But um, now normally, you know, I'll get them harnessed, uh, turn them loose in the stall, you know, with a, like a loose over check uh, for a day or two. You know, obviously not, I don't leave them harnessed. I mean, I'll unharness them and reharness them. Right. Um, but uh, then the first day or two, you know, we'll line drive them out in the field or up and down the driveway. Um, and then if they're turning and stopping and not running, uh, you know, we'll hook them and, and hopefully uh, they kind of know what's going on by then. Absolutely. So once once you do get them out on the track, you know, you worked with them on uh, all of their equipment, line driving them, and you're ready to hook them. Once you get them out on the track for the first time trying to jog, what are you really looking for them to do or what is your goal in mind for them? Uh, as long as they don't lay down and I come back on the cart, <laughs> uh, that's really the biggest thing for the first time. Um, I don't like I, as long. I basically just kind of try to keep them moving. Um, okay. You know, I don't care whether they're trotting, pacing. You know, I don't like for them to gallop. But as long as they're not stopping or or wanting to throw themselves, um, <laughs> that's the biggest thing for the first few days, in my opinion. Gotcha. So, so is there any kind of you know mileage goal you set, or again, does it really just depend on their attitude and, and how they react once they get out there? Oh, the first week or two, you know, we'll just jog them like two miles. Um, and I might turn them in different spots out on the track. Um, once they, they get to where, you know, they've done that maybe for a week or two, uh, we'll work them up to three miles. And uh, that's normally sometime in October. Um, mm -hmm. And then they'll jog three mile a day for the month of October. November, we might start working them up to like three and a half. And then by December, where they're going four miles. Um, we don't jog much farther than that, even our aged horses, um, for whatever reason. Um, we, I, I kind of like jogging three, four miles, maybe four and a half. But uh, um, we don't have very many horses that I would jog five miles or, or further. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So that's, that's pretty cool uh, to know. So. So really, once you get to January, is that when you're looking to maybe turn them and, and get them used to maybe going a racing speed or trying to get those kind of miles in them? Or what, uh, what is that process like of finally turning them? Yeah, so normally, it seems like here lately, we've had kind of nice weather in between uh, Christmas and New Year's. Mm -hmm. So um, when, and we, I guess for, for our situ situation, my dad doesn't have as much going on with the office, you know, around the holidays. They're at the veterinary clinic. So I'll try to turn some of those babies a little bit then. And, you know, I guess I always say, well, you know, we'll shoot for three minutes. And if, if they go, if they can beat it, great. If they don't, you know, it's not the end of the world. But um, that's normally, I guess, where we start is about three minutes. And um, I think that's fairly standard for most people anymore. You know, around the first of the year, they like to, to kind of start in on them and see what they've got. And um, we just use that as a starting point. So. Absolutely. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, shifting over, we talk a lot about, you know, breaking yearlings and stuff like that. But um, let's say once you get into the racing season here, you know, June and July and stuff like that, or, or even now, what is your daily schedule like? You know, what time are you getting up and getting out uh, to the track and stuff like that? Uh, so my wife and I had a little boy uh, back in August and I try to, to, to be home a little bit in the morning. Uh, to at least see him before he wakes up. So uh, we start at the barn around 8. Uh, my dad normally, he'll throw feet in between 7 and 7.30, but uh, we normally don't get a horse on the track until 8 o'clock. And uh, um, depending on the day, some of them will jog, some of them will train. Um, like uh, yesterday, we trained uh, six, I think six babies, uh, six of the two-year-olds. Um, we do jog and, and train on Sundays. I know some people don't, um, yeah. but uh, I, I like to give them the day off after they train if, if they go a little speed. Um, and, uh, and, and we turn them out some too. But, uh, but no, like I guess this time of year, uh, you know, we'll start in about 8 o'clock and normally have most of the jogging done you know, by noon, uh, have the jogging and training done by noon. And then uh, from there, you know, start working on cleaning up the barn and uh, mm -hmm. putting horses away and things of that nature. Gotcha. And then does does your schedule change any on nights that maybe you're driving or racing in the, the evenings, for example, like Sciota starting 6.15 post times uh, or 
pretty much it sounds like maybe eight to roughly one o'clock or so you're done by you know cleaning up and stuff like that yeah so a, a lot of very seldom do i have enough time to go uh, home in between being at the barn and going to the races so like it um, I'm notorious for leaving a little early. My wife would tell you that I'm late to everything, uh, but I'm not very often late to the races. Uh, I, I don't like to be rushed uh, as far as that goes. Um, so, so no, like in between time, you know, we may work on odds and ends things like um, give two-year-olds a haircut or we may, uh, you know, go through and, and fix some boards and some stalls, things like that, uh, or, or just clean up the things that you normally on a busy day don't have time to do or, or don't really want to mess with. Um, so we'll kind of work on some of that or I'll uh, mm -hmm. work on the track there at Marysville. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you talk about training six babies in one day. So what, uh, what kind of help do you have? How many people are helping you? Uh, so I've got one, uh, one, one guy who's my age, uh, his name is Robbie Predmore. He works uh, full-time there with me every day uh, and he's really good help. Uh, without him, I wouldn't be able to do, um, as much as what we do, um, we don't really have like set horses that we take care of. We all just work together. Um, but he's there every day uh, or six days a week. And then uh, Phil Cunningham, uh, he helps jog in the mornings. He's normally there from all eight to, to noon or, or 11 o'clock. Uh, he'll help jog. And then my dad, uh, when he's not busy at the, at the office, uh, he'll come over uh, and help jog or train. It had been a while since he was able to uh, to really jog anything or train anything. So uh, Sunday, my wife had to work in the afternoon, and my mom watched our little boy. So I said, well, you want to train a few of the babies and see what you think? Uh, so him and I just worked on that on Sunday. Um, but uh, for the most part, it's predominantly uh, me uh, and one other guy every day, and then uh, we do have a little bit of help jogging. Um, for the races, my siblings uh, will help. Uh, Hadley and Holden, they went to a lot of the fairs last year. And uh, uh, Mark Predmore will go to the races some as well. Okay, gotcha. Well, that's pretty cool then. So where, uh, where does your feed schedule, I guess, fall in between all that as well as far as, uh, you know, are you feeding two to three times a day? How many hours apart? What's the schedule like on that? Uh, so we normally, we just feed uh, grain twice a day. Um, it is what we do. Um, we uh, do not uh, um, feed lunch, um, but uh, the horses have got uh, uh, hay and hay cubes all the time. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So are you doing like a, uh, you mentioned dad might pop in seven, seven thirty feed grain. Are you going at nighttime then maybe six, seven o'clock as well uh, on grain then? Yeah, normally we try to keep them, keep them on a schedule. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So um, how many horses total at this point do you have in the barn? I know we've talked about uh, roughly nine two-year-olds right now, but what about uh, three-year-olds and maybe aged race horses? Uh, we've got, uh, there's 14 altogether. There's a little bit of an echo right now. Uh, I don't know if, it, I guess, I don't know if I'm hearing like the playback or. Pro you might be, it, I think it is coming out clear on our end, or at least to me it is. So it might, it might okay. just be echo on your spot, but I don't think everybody can hear that. But if somebody does, they'll comment here hopefully below. Okay. Um, the, uh, no, the, the bait, I guess we've got 14 going right now. Uh, there's three, three-year-olds nine two-year-olds and then uh uh two aged horses okay gotcha so 14 so for you is uh is that a lot of horses is that just right are you looking to add more where do things stand uh, personally i'd like to be somewhere between 15 and 20. Uh, i had okay. 17 for the winter um and that was a good number um you were there most of the day but i i don't mind working either um you know, as far as that goes, you know, I don't really want to just have five or six and uh, and be done at noon or one o'clock and be looking for something to do the rest of the day. Um, <laughs> right. I, I like to be busy. Um, and I find that uh, when I have too much time on my hands, I don't get, I don't, I, I'm not real productive. I would, I do my best work, I guess, when I'm probably a little short staffed and, 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 a, and a little over my head, but I guess that's just kind of the way <laughs> I'm wired. Um, I got gotcha. you. So, so before you switch, this is uh, off of our questions list I, I sent you, but before you were doing this full time, um, I think I read somewhere maybe that you were um, 
was it uh, a coach of some kind? I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. Yeah, so I uh, I coached the livestock judging team at Ohio State okay. yeah. uh, for four years. Um, I was really involved with livestock judging uh, in high school and in college. I actually went to college uh, on a scholarship to ju to judge. And uh, I went to two col different colleges in Illinois, uh, got my bachelor's degree and was on livestock teams there. And then I uh, had the opportunity to come back to Ohio State full time um, and coach the team and teach within the animal science department. So I did that while I was working on a master's degree. And then when COVID hit, uh, that changed a lot of things. Uh, we weren't able to travel. So from the university standpoint, it didn't make a lot of sense to keep me on uh, full time uh, when I, there wasn't a lot that I could do. Um, so I always wanted kind of an excuse to be able to try to train horses and race horses and drive. Um, so it really worked out. Um, but um, my wife and, and family, they've all been super supportive of it. That's cool, man. So, um, you know, now again, you're around horses every single day. What is, what is your favorite part of being around them each day? Oh, like, I'll be honest today, like when I went out to the track with the first one, I kind of like felt like I was 14 again on summer break because the weather was nice. Yeah. And uh, I was like, yeah, you know, it just, it felt like summer. I felt like a kid again. Uh, but no, as far as like my favorite part about it is, is the competitiveness of it. Um, you know, I, I don't want to do things that, that people don't want to try to be good at, I guess. Um, I probably take most things too seriously from a competition standpoint. Um, but, uh, but no, I just, I enjoy working with the animals and, and watching them develop um, and, and winning. You know, that's, that's, I don't, I don't care what anybody says, but I don't know anybody who's not had fun when they're winning. That's right. That's right. That's, that's always my number one goal with anything, man. I want to, I want to have fun doing it, but also winning is really fun. So <laughs> right. that's the number, number one way to have it. But uh, so we talk, we talk a lot about being around the horses, the training side of things for you, Hank. I wanted to talk about uh, your driving as well, because obviously you do an outstanding job uh, holding the reins behind these horses. So for you, how much preparation do you get to put into your drives? Because, again, you're out every morning, uh, all morning with these horses, getting them ready, trained, uh, and then heading to the racetrack. Do you get to watch replays? Do you get to study programs? How do you prepare for drives? Oh, well, you know, I guess like it's probably different uh, driving at the raceways and like at the fairs because like with the fairs, you know, after the first few fairs, you know, you look at a program quick and a, a lot of those colts uh, in the stake races are racing against the same horses. Uh, so you kind of get a feel for who's what and, and what they can do and maybe what they can't do. Uh, so halfway through the summer, you've got a pretty good idea. If you look to your left or right, you know, say, oh, well, that's that horse who's such and such. Um, is driving and this is what he did last week or whatever. Um, now I, I do spend a lot of time looking at the program. I probably don't watch as many replays as I should um, to prepare for races. Uh, but I will say I watch every replay um, that we're that we have a horse in normally three to four times afterwards. Okay. Um, normally right after the races. And then uh, later that evening, I'll watch it back a few times and just look to see if there's things I could have done differently, um, you know, to have the horse in a better spot or if we, we, if we did as well as we were going to do uh, or, or whatever it may be. Uh, but I do, I do study the program um, and I try to, to, to make sure that our horses are, are classified where they can be competitive. You know, whether they're 25 to 1 or 2 to 1, I don't care about that. Um, but uh, just putting them where they belong and where they, they can, you know, be as competitive as they can. Absolutely. So for you too, when you're actually driving and stuff, do you have a preference on rather driving a trotter or pacer and well, why? Uh, the pacers are easier to drive. Uh, but I tell you, there's like nothing like sitting behind a nice trotter, like a trotter that goes like a pacer. Those are fun uh, because they're just so handy. It's like all, all the, your worries go out of the way, out, out the window. Um, but uh, I, I guess if I could only have one or the other, um, if I was smart, I'd, I'd tell you I should probably have pacers because I feel like a barn full of trotters. If, if you have some bad luck, uh, you may not have a barn in a year or two. Uh, but uh, if, if I could only have one or the other, I'd probably have trotters, um, even though I'd have gray hair probably by the time I was 30. Um, the, fun, the good ones make it really fun. 
Well, how, how old are you now, by the way, Hank? Are you 26, I think I read, maybe yeah. somewhere? Is that right? Yeah, I'm 26. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So for you, uh, back to the horses and stuff, if you had to put, I guess, a horse together, what would it look like as far as um, you like maybe a bigger, stronger horse or maybe a smaller, more athletic one? Would you prefer a horse that had more speed, more stamina, a horse that could lead versus close? Like I said, if, if you had a chance to put together your perfect ideal race horse to drive, what would it be like? Oh, a fast one. Um, <laughs> I guess I don't care what they look like as long as they can go a little bit. Uh, but, but no, I mean, I guess in my opinion, you know, confirmation is important. Uh, but at the same time, you know, they make boots for a reason, too. So I, I guess I, I can see both sides of that. Um, you know, ideally, yeah, you'd want the, the horse that's built perfect. You know, uh, for me, I guess, you know, a horse that can get over the ground that's athletic. I don't really care how big or small they are. Uh, some of the best horses we've had over the years were just little guys uh, that had some heart. Uh, my grandpa, he always said, I'd rather have a, a little horse that tries than a big horse that's lazy. Um, mm -hmm. So as long as they're athletic, they get over the ground nice. Um, and if they do it in a way um, that's that's somewhat effortless, uh, those are the ones I think that, you know, you notice, you know, like Charlie May, for instance, when that horse paces a quarter in 26 seconds, it doesn't look like he's working very hard. <laughs> and it just does it so easy. Mm -hmm. So, um I don't know if that if that kind of helps. I mean, as long as they're fast, that's <laughs> that's the key. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So once once you get them out there on the track, whether it's your horse, someone else's horse, uh, when you're warming them up or maybe you're scoring them down for a race, what are you looking for in a horse? And then also, um, I guess I'll I'll leave it that, and then I'll ask part two later. But what are you looking for when you're warming up or scoring down a horse? Uh, so. The, uh, Maybe I'm old school, and I know my grandpa and dad, they're a little old school, but I always like to take them the right way of the track. I don't, I don't care if they're, even if they're an older horse. Um, you know, I'll start out going the wrong way, and I may work them, you know, jog, just jog them a mile uh, the wrong way, and then I'll turn them and go a light trip before they race, uh, mainly uh, to make sure that they see everything on the inside of the track because, you know, every track's different. Some horses, you know, get goofy about different things, um, but – as far as warming up, I like to take them and at least make sure they see the things there in the infield. Um, before a race, like when we're out post parading, uh, it kind of depends on the horse. A lot of ours I don't score down. I'll just keep them going the wrong way. Uh, mm -hmm. But a few of ours have gotten a tendency to get a little hot and a little worked up. So I just mainly with those horses try to kind of keep quiet um, and just keep them happy. Um, now we've had some horses in the past that are a little lazy or if you think you're going to leave a little bit and you need to have one's attention, you, know, you may work them a quarter in 29 seconds or something like that and kind of get the blood pumping. And, uh, but uh, I think it does depend on the horse because um, there's definitely some horses you wouldn't want to go out there and not turn, but then there's other horses that you wouldn't want to go out there and try to turn because uh, right. you may race before, before the gate folds. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So, I guess I guess uh, asking more about maybe scoring them down or just warming up after a post parade and stuff. You know, are you gonna are you gonna give them a little bit of a stronger workout before if they're lazier or if they're more hot or I guess how did you say that? Like, what what kind of horse would you want to score down really hard, so to speak? A uh, lazy one uh, or a horse that just kind of goes through the motions that doesn't try very hard. Uh, mm -hmm those horses that way, you know, you kind of have their attention when the time comes um, where they know, Hey, you know, for the next two minutes, uh, I need to be kind of on my toes and awake. Um, yeah. You know, the hot ones, you don't have to worry about, about that so much, you know, it's more so, you know, kind of quieting them down and just keep them from getting too aggressive or too grabby. Um, but uh, mainly a lazier horse is one that I would score down or a horse that can't leave any, uh, those ones I do like to score down a little because I think you can help kind of get them off the gate a little better that way. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So uh, during the summer, you know, you're hitting a ton of fairs. Basically you guys start the first fair that's out, you know, Paulding and you guys will wrap up down um, at Lancaster. I can't remember what County that is anymore. I can't um, either. I don't know. Fair Fairfield County. Is that right? That 
that sound right? I'm not sure. But uh, anyways, the, whole, the point being, you're, you're on the fair trail a lot. What are some of your favorite fairs to go to? Um, it could be because it's a nice facility. It could be because it has a great atmosphere. Maybe it's a really nice racetrack surface. What are some of your favorite fairs to go to throughout the summer? Um, I always like going to uh, Salina. I think the track there is good. Um, I like racing there. Uh, I would say uh, this past year is the first year I ever went to Montpelier, and I will go back there uh, just because we had a good day. I think I won five that day. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, you know, naturally you, you want to go back, Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, I know I like racing at Salina. I like racing at Urbana. Uh, the track's good there as well. Um, oh, Circleville is always nice too. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And which one, uh, for you maybe brings, brings the best atmosphere as far as it's a lively, a lively fair and brings out a lot of fans and stuff like that. Are there, are there any specific fairs that you can recall that you enjoy going to because of that? Uh, Greenville is always good that way. Um, you know, there's always a ton of people there watching the races. Um, you know, they, they, they support it. Um, I would think, Oh, Bu Cyrus has got a good fan crowd. I, I remember there was a little girl actually, Bu Cyrus, this past year, uh, standing there by the winter circle. And every time I went by, she'd yell, "Hey, Hank!" and and uh, we, we got lucky enough to win a few races. So I had her come down and get a picture taken. Um, That's cool. But no, I think regardless of where you're at anymore, you know, most of the people that are in the harness racing industry, uh, they're good people, and um, you know they're they're always enjoyable to be around. Absolutely. So we talk talk about some of the fairs. What about raceways or paramutual tracks? Where do you enjoy going most on that route? Um, my favorite paramutual track is Silent of Downs um, in Northfield Park. I like those two very well. Um, you know, Scioto is only about 40 minutes for us. Uh, Northfield's about two hours and 20 minutes. Um, but like our horses fit good at Cleveland. Um, and uh, as long as they can be competitive, that's where I want to race them. Um, but uh, Scioto and Northfield, I enjoy. Okay, gotcha. And for you, when you get to the track, how do you describe your driving style? Do you like to be more aggressive, more patient, conservative? Um, if you had to describe it for somebody, what would you say? Uh, I think it kind of depends on the horse. I mean, um, right now I would say I'm probably – uh, a little more conservative. I mean, I can I can rile one up and, and be aggressive, um, but I, I like to see more of our horses come from off the pace, uh, and mainly because you know, we don't sometimes have the horsepower that you can put on the front and fend somebody off from the three ace pull on and have to and not be able to get a breather. So I think a lot that really you know kind of dictates how you drive. I mean, um, if if somebody says, "Well, I'm an aggressive driver." And, and they drive every horse aggressive, uh, they're not going to drive, you know, all those horses well. Uh, mm -hmm. And same way for somebody that likes to be conservative, you know, if they like kind of coming off the page, that doesn't mean you can't put a horse on the front. Um, you know, like Chris Page, I think, is one that's very good about that. You know, if you watch 90% of the horses that he drives uh, come from off of a helmet, but if he's got a horse that's much the best or a horse that can get off the wings, um, he's not scared to put one on the front. And I guess if I were to, to say one, you know, what style you try to drive like, you know, uh, I think Chris does a very good job. And um, I guess I try to emulate a little bit what he does because I think he teaches horses how to race. Um, and uh, he teaches them how to pass horses and keep them brave. Absolutely. I, I agree with that too. So that's, that's a really good point you made. So you're driving on a variety of tracks throughout the year. Obviously, the fair tracks are half miles. Northfield's a half. Uh, but then you have three five-eighths of a mile tracks here in Ohio as well. So for you, how do you have to race them differently? And, you know, do you have to be more aggressive on those half-mile tracks than the five-eighths? You know, I don't know that you do um, at, like, the raceways, per se. Um, here, like, at Northfield, you can – a lot of people tell you, you know, you got to be aggressive. Um, we've made a lot of money riding the rail up there. And when things open up with the passing lane uh, that they have, you know, you still got a chance. That's probably my least favorite thing about Miami Valley and Dayton 
is most of the time, like in the winter months, at least this year, I didn't have enough horsepower to, to pull up the three A's pole and be out the whole mile and grinding. Um, but then if you stay in, there's no, nothing opens up and, you know, you don't get a chance to race your horse. So, uh, I do prefer driving on a track that's got a passing lane. Um, if it's a five ace, uh, now like a half mile County fair track, those, uh, I like those, um, same way with Cleveland. Um, I probably prefer racing on a half, um, mm-hmm. but, uh, but I like driving a side of the downs too. So. Absolutely. So one thing for me, again, I, I tell people all times, I'm still very new to the harness racing game and stuff, but for example, um, on a half mile track, you know, such as a fair track where there's not a passing lane and stuff like that, is a two hole trip or a pocket trip more risky, I guess, on a half mile? Do you put yourself in more danger of being locked in than you would at, you know, maybe a Scioto Downs with a passing lane? Or again, there are some times at Miami or uh, Dayton that maybe the inside will open up when a leader starts getting tired and stuff like that. Um, but again, is a pocket trip, two hole trip at a fair track, a little more risky, you think, or, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, sometimes I think that can be a really bad spot to be in at a fair track, um, sitting in the two hole because, uh, you know, if you've got some horse, um, and there's nowhere to go, you really kind of end up in a bad spot. Um, but I guess for me, I'd rather be locked in and have a horse that, that's brave, uh, than be three wide out in the middle of the track or um, give one too much air because the nice thing about, you know, getting one locked in, they'll be braver the next start. Mm-hmm. Okay. Gotcha. So again, that was a more of an amateur question for me. Cause it seems like, you know, you watch the racing at Scioto and, and people really seem to gravitate or um, it's a fight for a kind of a pocket trip there. Cause you know, you have yeah. the passing lane. Uh, versus on a half mile track, you probably more so prefer to be on the point, I would assume. Right. Yeah, I would agree. You know, like on a half, you know, I think if you if you can get away on the front, that's great. Uh, but I don't really want to get away second or third if I can help. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And for you, you know, whether we'll, we'll keep it on the fairs here, for example, but who are some of your fiercest competitors you have to go against at the fairs? Oh, it's driving wise. Um, you know, they call him King of the Fairs, Jeff Nysonger. Uh, you know, he's got a lot of good horses here to drive in the last few years. And, and uh, um, so, you, so he's always been a tough one, you know, at the fairs. Absolutely. And what about, uh, I guess, at the raceways and stuff like that? Who are, who are some of the toughest guys? Obviously, it's, it's a very tough driver colony, whether you're at Northfield or Scioto. But who are some of the top dogs there that you have to battle against? Oh, I mean, like at Cleveland, you know, Aaron, Ronnie, Kurt, Ryan, you know, Greg, all those guys are good horsemen. Uh, they all do a good job driving. Um, but, uh, but, no, I mean, I think those guys are, are awful tough. You know, Chris Lims. Um, and then, like, you go to Scioto, you've got your, you know, you got Chris Page, Dan Noble, Brett Miller, um, Josh Sutton. You, you know, you, there's, there's so many guys you can leave off the list. Um, you know, just because there's so many good drivers. Um, but, uh, you know, they're all tough. I think, you know, whoever's got the best horse, that's normally the guy that's the toughest. Absolutely. So um, for you, we talked a little bit earlier. Again, you're, you're doing this full time. You're still very young in the game, 26 years old. So for you, what are some of the obstacles that you're having to overcome in a sport that You know, quite frankly, it is a a sport that the older generation kind of, um, I guess, runs or just has a big part of. Well, I I think, like, um, you know, for me, probably the biggest obstacle that I've had to jump or or try to kind of get over um, is just trying to get an opportunity to to pick up some catch drives. Um, You know, people ask, well, man, why do you, you there's two of you. Why do you have 17 or 18 horses? Or why do you, why do you buy so many babies? Well, you know, I, I'm guaranteeing myself those drives. Um, and that's a long way. That's kind of a hard way to look at it, I guess, is you, know, you think about all the time you put into developing a baby from the time of breaking them, you know, to their first start. You think, well, you know, I'm going to do all this work just so I've got something to drive. Um, but, uh, you know, that's something like that I would like to improve on and hopefully have an opportunity to build upon is, is you know, be able to pick up some drives and, and, and do more catch driving. I always want to have a stable of some sort, um, 
but uh, you know, the ultimate goal would be you know, to get to where you know you can drive every night somewhere. Gotcha. Okay. So, uh, kind of an off the track question here, but uh, obviously throughout the season you're on the road a lot, and hell, you're on the road right now. Uh, but uh, for you, what is a drive to the track like? Do you like to get uh, maybe some music going, get pumped up a little bit? Are you more calm and relaxed, quiet and focused? You know, how would you describe most of your drives to the track? Oh, most of them. Most of the time, uh, they're they're pretty relaxed. You know, I I don't like to drive. Um, without having something to drink, normally it's a diet coke or an iced tea. Um, but uh, uh, I don't know. I used to listen to the radio all the time. Um, when I was in college, uh, I went to school in Illinois, so it was about a seven-hour drive. And I think my freshman year, I put eighty-five thousand miles on my car because I came home like every weekend. And uh, wow, I spent a lot of time driving. So the driving aspect wasn't bad. Uh, but anymore, the older I've gotten. Um, I can't tell you the last time I turned the radio on when I was driving down the road. Uh, as bad as I hate to say that, a little like peace and quiet goes a long way with me anymore. Um, hey, try to get some sanity in your life, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like to, or you know, I, I will call some guys, and I, I've got some good friends from college. Uh, most of them live out of state, and I'll call them oh a couple times a week, and we'll talk back and forth to the track. Um, but, uh, but no, most of the time, you know, I'll either be uh, on the phone or just kind of driving. Okay, gotcha. And so next question, again, uh, really there aren't days off, so to speak, in this business. But, for example, for you, maybe on nights that you don't have to race or, again, if you do get that rare off day, what do you like to do? I, you know, for, for the last nine months, uh, spend time with, with my family. You know, we had a little boy and so Anytime I can be home you know, with him and my wife, um, I enjoy that. Uh, I, I guess I always saw it like you know, before you have kids, oh, you know, you know, I don't understand how kids can get in the way of things, you know, and, and to me, like, he's never been in the way. I want to make sure I'm there for him mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, you know, just to not miss anything or not miss any more than I have to, I should say, uh, because in this line of business, you know, it, it is – you know, tough on families as far as, you know, the hours away from home and things like that. So um, I want to make sure that, you know, on the nights I don't have to be away, you know, I'm with him and my wife. Gotcha. Okay. And uh, that's, that's pretty cool there to, to share that. And for you, uh, talking about you either as a driver or a trainer, let's just say we have a new fan that's watching the show here tonight and they're meeting you or hearing from you, I should say, for the first time. Um, why should that person become a fan of Hank LeVan and root you on at the track? You know, what are some qualities you think maybe uh, people like about you or, or why, again, they should be a fan of yours? Well, I think most people um, would say, you know, we're honest people, you know, me and my family, and, uh, you know, we work hard. Um, so you know, I would say more blue collar than most as far as that goes. Um, but, uh, uh, but no, and I guess another reason, I guess I would say, you know, uh, if you like watching the fair races, uh, we're at a lot of them. So you get multiple opportunities to root us on. Um. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. I, I mentioned it at the top of the show, uh, talking about the LeVan family. Again, been around for five decades racing. So, uh, And it was one of the first names that I heard when I went to my first race here. Uh, at the All Glaze County Fair in Wapakoneta. So that was kind of the first time I, I've watched you guys race. Um, really liked your colors, liked the Curse of L on the back of, of the uh, jacket and stuff like that. So um, always been a fan of your guys' and stuff and, uh, and a lot of fun following a lot of your horses. So uh, shifting to, to me right now, so I'm, I'm helping Tim Ignarski at the All Glaze County Fairgrounds in Wapak. He's been showing me the ropes of all this since October, and um, it's been a very big learning and eye-opening experience for me, just how much work goes into the sport. Uh, but for someone like me that's wanting to maybe be um, an owner, a trainer, a driver in the future, what words of advice would you give me? Oh, as long as you're not scared of work, you'll be just fine. Uh, I've got like this weird um, saying that as long as you're willing to put the time and the effort in, you don't have to have any talent. Uh, you know, the good Lord will take care of you uh, from that standpoint. Uh, as long as you're honest and um, you're, like I said, you, you can't be, you know, it's got to be a priority. Um, 
but if you're an honest person and you take it serious as far as the time that it takes, um, you know, you can do anything, whether it's train horses, you know, play golf, uh, play video games, whatever it is that you're into. Um, you know, if you put enough time into it, you can get good at it. Absolutely. That's, that's great words of advice. And I'll be honest with you, most of the people I've asked that question to, hard work seems, hard work seems to be the uh, number one trick to this business for sure. So you can't get by being lazy and harness racing for sure. But, no, uh, you cannot. We got uh, we got a couple things here for you, Hank, from some people are watching. We actually had Robert Fredmore uh, comment on the video and he asked, what is the best horse you've ever driven? Oh, probably the best horse. Um, I would say uh, uh, Steady Warrior. Um, we bought him at the May sale. Um, we were. I was looking for something to kind of race, and then that summer uh, I just got my P license, and uh, I just went back through the barns and stuff, and I thought, well, heck, this horse has got a mark in fifty. He's made a quarter of a million. Um, you know, but he had like a year off and then he came back and qualified and it only had like two or three starts. And uh, we, we, he was an old stud horse. And at first I was like, man, I really don't want a seven or eight year old stud horse. I'm kind of a pain. <laughs> and I went back and looked at him. I was like, yeah, he don't look bad. Um, went back and looked at some other horses. Went back the second time. I figured out he had one eye. Um, his oh, forelock was so long, uh, and it was over the one side, and he was just ornery enough. Uh, I never noticed the first time <laughs> I looked at him. And long story short, I ended up buying him for like 6000 And uh, um, his first start for us, he actually fit the open at Cleveland, and he was sixth, and he paced him 52 and change. And uh, um, wow. he was a nice horse. Long, I think before we had him, uh, he got hurt, and uh, that's why he had some time off. Uh, he hurt a coffin joint. And uh, if he was uh, like 100% sound, uh, we never would have had him because, uh, you know, he'd have still been, you know, at the, in the open level, you know, out east where he, where he previously was. But uh, mm -hmm. that horse, he, could, he was a true professional. Uh, he, was, he was a nice, very nice horse to drive. I wish I knew what I know now as opposed to um, what little I knew then because I, I think I could have been a lot better with him. Absolutely. And we had uh, Robert Predmore also commented and said something maybe along the lines of uh, Curse of L. Was that your first driving win? Yep. Yep. That was my first win. That's the first horse that I own part of. Um, and uh, we named her Curse of L because of the silks. Um, but uh, yeah, that was up at Oak Harbor. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. And I think uh, Robert said that win came at Oak Harbor. Does that sound right? and we got over the half and like 106 and i think we paced the back half in 59 but nobody pulled so um <laughs> i don't know <laughs> well cool hey we we might have a couple connection problems so we'll get this uh wrapped up here shortly for you and i i've kept you for i think 50 minutes here so far so um we do have a question in from megan levan and she said who is your biggest driving or training critic <laughs> Uh, her, without a doubt. Uh, my wife, she can be kind of brutal on me uh, as far as the driving. She doesn't say much about the training unless I, unless one gets hurt or, or gets sore or something. Then it's my fault that way. Um, but the driving, man, you know, she'll say, why don't, why don't you go to the front? Why don't you? She, she does not like me to be at the back. Um, and uh, um, so, yeah, she is definitely my biggest critic. That's funny. But uh, la one of the, la the last fan questions we've had came from uh, Dan Kelly, who actually knows uh, your father and grandfather uh, in the business and stuff. He asked, what's the best horse the LeVan family has ever owned and raised? Um, I would say the most sentimental horse uh, was Carmel Dumpling. Um, he was a horse my dad bought uh, as a yearling. Um, we raced him clear through until he had to retire um, after he was 15 and uh, he had almost 500 I think he had 503 starts and 
97 wins or something like that and made, uh, I don't know, 300 and some thousand. And that's back when they raced for $1,700 every week. Um, so, uh, wow. he was, he was a good old horse and I, uh, we, him and, uh, two other old retirees are actually, uh, and, uh, so at, at the can farm, hear, is can you hear me? L and Hanky L still there? Yeah, sorry, we lost you for a sec. I promise we're getting it wrapped up. But uh, are Herbie L and Hanky L still on the farm retired, or who do you guys have there? Uh, you're cutting out just a little bit. I'm sorry. What would you say? Oh, I was asking, uh, what, what horses do you have retired, I guess, still on the farm? Is, is Herbie L and Hanky L there, or who do you guys have? Uh, yeah, so uh, the the horses we've got, if I heard you correctly, you're cutting out just a little bit. Um, but uh, the three older horses that we've got that are that are retired are uh, Hanky L, Herbie L, and Caramel Dumpling. Okay, yep, that's what I was asking. Well, Hank, we'll uh, we'll get this wrapped up. I know we're running into some connection problem stuff, but uh, and hopefully you can hear this, but. Uh, I just want to say I, I appreciate your time tonight. Again, we had a ton of fans that wanted to see you on the show. So thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to appear for us. And hopefully I'll see you on the fairs sometime this summer. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you very much, Austin. Hey, absolutely. Hank, hopefully uh, you and your little boy and wife uh, take care, stay healthy. And again, we'll see you down the road. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, man. Well, cool, guys. That was Hank LeVan on our show. Uh, that was a, a really cool session with him, for sure, getting to, to talk about his history in the sport and stuff like that. Um, I know I usually like to start the show off by diving into uh, maybe a driver, trainer, owner's background, but uh, it does seem like if you, if you would happen to Google the LeVan family, you can find a lot of stuff online about them. And again, that's, that's part of the reason I do the paddock party is I take somebody that maybe you've never heard of or somebody you can't find much on the internet about, uh, and this gives you a chance to interact with them one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, with, with Hank's family history being out there in a lot of places that you can Google, um, I wanted to kind of focus more on Hank uh, and his journey here over you know, the last year since he started full-time in the business. But again, uh, Google the LeVan family and harness racing sometime, and you will learn some pretty awesome stuff, uh, a lot of history there, and a lot of great uh, horses have gone through their stables. So I want to thank everybody for tuning in tonight to our show. Again, uh, hopefully we can keep this rolling on a more consistent basis. It's been tough. Um, I am a real estate broker as a full-time job, and things have been extremely uh, <laughs> busy and good for me, uh, <coughs> excuse me, over the last two months. But um, because of that, also, I haven't been able to do the paddock party show. So I'm glad we got back on it tonight. Appreciative for Hank LeVan and his family um, and everybody that carved out some time for us. And really thankful for you guys for tuning in and sending in your questions. So if you have somebody you want to see on the show next week, uh, we'll try to get a show going. Uh, comment their name below. I have a couple people I've reached out to that said that they're in. So we'll see if we can get them lined up uh, and try to do this again next Monday night at 8 p.m. So thank you guys for tuning in. Hope you have a great rest of your week and make sure you watch some racing this week. A lot of great stuff happening at Scioto Downs and in the rest of the Buckeye State.